Uh, great. Okay. Anybody have any questions before we start? Questions on the assignment? Anything I could answer? On the install to install of Ubuntu, are you guys going to have Java installed, or are we going to have to provide packages for that? The default. So whatever is not installed by default when you first install Ubuntu, uh, then I believe yes. Do you have any place we might look to know if we wanted to use Java for something? What the what packages you'd actually need to? That's a good question. Is it on the? Yes, let me know. Do what? Uh, one seven, probably. I, I asking me or Eric? Because it doesn't matter to me, it matters to you, right? Yeah. I mean, it's Ubuntu 1404, 64 bit. So whatever's on there, uh, that's yeah, what. It's not. Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. Anybody else know? Is there a yeah, and what would be the permission of like, the user be having when you running the program? So it would be a root, having a root permission? Why? Was the Morris worm? Did the Morris worm have root permission? No, it didn't need to. No, not necessarily, right? So yeah, that's what you that's why I said you have to be careful in code. Yeah, regarding the permissions. Exactly. Try it. Yeah. And you have to just make sure and it's, you know, you don't have to explicitly check, uh, but you need to make sure that when you encounter permission issues, your app doesn't crash. Right? You can't assume that you can just read any file on the system. Um, okay, back to the question. I don't know. I'll try to look up. If anybody finds it, if there's a list of the default packages that's sorted in Ubuntu. I think I can find it somewhere. I think I can run the command in the testing environment to dump out all the packages that are installed. So I do install some things like build essentials, uh, some C stuff. So I'm actually still setting it up. So if you have any, some, you have something that specifically, I think it's a little tricky with Java though because there are different packages. So that's oh, why. They have to be open. It has to be the open. Right. One. Not really. They're not. They're not support anymore. Okay. Uh, the Oracle gave you. Uh, yeah, it should be not a problem. People did it last time I used the system. So, uh, but yeah, remind me if you send me an email, I'll try and find out, yeah. find the list, and post it so that you can know. Yeah. Um, official um, download in Ubuntu site is fourteen oh four point three. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? check that it's syntactically valid or whatever, right? So, yeah, you should, you know, yeah, exactly, you're a worm, so you should do best effort and try to find as many things as possible, even if the stuff is bad. On the flip side, though, right, you want to make sure you're grabbing the correct things. Um, you know, you don't want to spread to unknown hosts and waste your energy, right? So, if there's a file format that has comments, for instance, right, you probably don't want to grab stuff in there even if it looks like a host name. It's a comment, right? It's not a, actually a valid host name that's used by the file. Yeah. And so if we follow the, the file format guidelines as in those links, we should be set. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's, that's part of uh, part of the project, right? Is that you're the Morris Worm writer. The only thing you have available to you to find these things is the docs, right? How does it actually work? How does the file format work? So you have to be able to read it, understand it, and actually implement. I know you said um, programming language is not optional, but uh, I was thinking. Well, it's not optional. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, does it, does, um, won't it be suspicious if a worm would install like 10 packages and um, okay. something like this? In True, but you're not actually installing any packages, right? You're installing, I mean, yeah. That's more of just a submission system environment. It's, and I agree. I mean, you know, if you want to be really cool, you write it in like assembly and you can do all kinds of other stuff, right? We're just focusing on one portion of the word functionality and trying to emulate that. But in an environment so that we can all test it and all that stuff. Yeah. Or you could do it kind of crazy, you could do it like have multiple VMs and have it all obfuscated and do all kinds of stuff like that. But that's a different class. That's more about like malware rather than vulnerability. So yeah. More questions? Yeah. Um, to the main file while while you're building the script that will have 
shortly after this. So I got the submission website up. Um, it's just not actually hooked into anything and nothing actually tests anything. Um, but you'll be able to sign up with your ASU ID. I'll send out an email. Later today you should have external access. It's just internal for now. Um, so yeah, that should be up very shortly. So it should be good. Any other questions? So many of you. All right, let's get right back to networking security. So we looked at the IP datagram and we've been talking about, we're trying to, so to refresh everyone, right? We're trying to study uh, the IP, we're trying to study the networking stack so we can understand what the points of attack are, how we can attack it, and uh, where the vulnerabilities are. Um, and this is very helpful when you're, you know, you're analyzing a network or analyzing, uh, trying to understand what types of attacks are possible, right? You have to understand how applications are communicating with each other, what types of things they're using, what types of games you can play. Um, so we looked at the header, uh, in case you forgot, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so the IP header is composed of so bring it down a little bit more. Normally it's uh, 20 bytes if there's no options. Um, it has a version, so the version is four bits, four or six, right, we talked about that. Uh, a header length, which describes the number of 32-bit words in the header, including the options. Uh, the type of service, so this are bits that are used to flag priority or quality of service or there's actually an unused bit in here. Why would you include an unused bit in something that's so important like the IP protocol? Think about every packet that is sent on all of our millions and billions of devices is including this unused bit. Cache lines? Cache lines? Ooh. Um, tricky, maybe. What was that? Yeah, future purpose, exactly. Like, you know, once you define something like this, it's very hard to change it or go back on things. So yeah, maybe you add, you leave in a little bit of space so that, that way later on you can say, okay, let's use this flag for some other purpose, right? To indicate, I don't know, we want to switch to IPv6 or something, right? Okay, then the total length. So we need to know, right, the total length including not just the header but also the data of the packet. Uh, so because of this, right, so this is where we see a technical uh, description actually influences kind of the protocol, right? So we have 16 bits in here. So it's the length in bytes, so the maximum of an IP packet is 65,000 bytes. Actually a lot. Um, an ID, so a unique identifier for a datagram. So, I mean, we kind of talk, why do you want an ID on an IP packet? Do we really care? Just send in packets. Ordering and unordering. Ordering and unordering? IP doesn't give us anything about ordering or unordering. It makes absolutely no guarantee. Can we use the fragmentation? The fragmentation? So. When you join back if I get we need some moderators. Yeah, so what's fragmentation? Why do we need? The MQ size of the adapter is not big enough to pass the entire packet. Right, so we gotta remember where on the stack we are, right? We could be, we're pretty low, but we're not actually on the physical layer. So let's say a host wants to send, I don't know, the max size to uh, 65,000 bytes, right? But you're on a, whatever, a physical host where you can't actually send that many bytes, right? Physically, that link layer does not support packets of that size. What fragmentation allows you to do is to rip apart the packets into sizes that are uh, appropriate for the, links, uh, the link layer size, and then you send each of those packets, and then this ID tells the other end, okay, this packet's been fragmented, and every fragment with this ID goes at certain offsets, and that's how it's able to reassemble the packet. I think we'll look at that. 
uh, because that's actually an important thing. Uh, yeah, so the flags and the offset, so these are used for fragmentation. Say if this packet's been fragmented, what offset it goes on. Uh, time to live, so this isn't like a speed thing or like a, you know, a bomb that's about to go off. Uh, so what, why do we need a time to live? Number of hops. Why do we need it though? Uh, or <laughs> doesn't populate the whole next host. Yes, right. So you know we're trying to get a packet from one host to another host using however many intermediaries, right? We don't actually know how many there are in between. But so there's absolutely no guarantee on what path our packet's going to take, how it's going to move through the network, where things are going to move, right? So. Um, the idea is if we just send a packet out, and let's say there's a routing error where it goes into a loop, do we want this packet to just keep looping forever like a ghost in the matrix? So it just like keeps going and going and going. No, we want it to stop event sometime, right? If it's not able to get to the host. So the idea is when the, uh, when the host uh, sends out the IP packet, it sets the TTL however it wants to the max or whatever. And every hop along the way is going to decrement that number and change and send the packet. And so that, that way, when it gets to zero, the router knows it can drop the packet on the floor and not send it anymore. OK, then this is where we get we break some kind of uh, abstraction in the upper layers. So this is where we specify if the IP packet is a TCP packet or a UDP packet. Then we have a checksum, so we do the checksum over the header to make sure that there weren't any transmission errors or anything there. Um, and then we have our two addresses. So we have the source address and the destination address. Uh, remember, 32-bit addresses, so they take up 32 bits in our headers. Any questions on that? Cool. So the IP headers, uh, so the IP uh, headers includes the options section, right? And so this is variable in length. It can have yeah, more or less. Um, they're actually they're identified so the first byte defines what option it is, and then it could have an optional length after that. Um, I was hoping something I knew would be here. I mean, I know a lot of you. Uh, anybody in security or military operations know if they actually use this byte still? The IP options. So they have one of the options uh, specifies the security clearance level of the packet. <coughs> so that way, at the network level, the military could drop a packet if somehow a confidential packet got out to an, an open public network. Um, no, nobody, or you can't say? Yeah, I understand. <laughs> you can't say. Uh, it used to have, uh, and maybe I actually want to look at it, see if they actually do this now. Um, some of these IP options are actually for debugging purposes. Right? You're an administrator, you're trying, right? The internet is an incredibly complicated system of hosts of hosts and networks of networks, right? things you don't control, of routing tables, of switches you don't control. So one option says record the route. Every router along the way put a timestamp on the packet to say where it was and how it got there and at what time. Uh, presumably so you could help debug uh, connection problems. Um, I think, I have to say, so is this good from a security perspective? No. No? Why no? Because even the hacker wouldn't from to know which part the packet is taking. Yeah, right? right? So you're giving out information to somebody who's outside of your network just because they asked nice, nicely, right? They put this option and your switch says, yes, yeah, I'm the switch, I saw it at this date. So this could actually allow an attacker to help map your entire network and try to see what are all the hosts and what are all the switches in your network. Um, it can, oh, it can timestamp, so not just record the IP address, but also do the time that it got there. Um, Source routing is actually really interesting. Uh, so this specifies a list of IP addresses. This actually the source, right, is the IP packet, tries to specify the exact route that the packet should take. Is this a security problem? Could be. Could be. Yeah. Why? Because a hacker could set the route in such a way that it goes by his machines and he gets to know the data. Yeah, it could go by his machines. What other things could you do with it? Can I overload a machine? One of your switches? Right? I want to take off, I want to do a DOS attack. I'll set all of my sources to all go through your one switch, and that one switch fails, and then everything behind it fails. Right? A 
essentially, it's another case where you're actually giving an external entity control over your network and where packets flow in your network. So I'm also fairly certain that nobody actually respects these headers anymore. Uh, it'd be fun to play around with this. And there's actually a lot more of these headers that are defined. Oh, but why did they include it? So we say it's bad, right? Why would you include this source route thing when you're defining IP options? Maybe you want to test if a route is down or not. Yeah, maybe you want to test if a route is down, or maybe you know reliability, right? When these things were first established, who knows? You know, maybe you know a better route than the admins do, or somebody else's network does. So you can specify exactly how. Uh, can we for the speed up thing? Yeah, could be a speed up thing. Yeah, maybe you know a shortcut, right, in the network. You're like, oh, I can go through this host and then go out that way. Yeah. Okay. So IP, what's below IP? What's below IP? Hmm? The data, the link layer. Yeah, exactly, right? So the IP packet, right, is actually encapsulated. So the IP header and the IP data are all encapsulated in the frame, so the, uh, the link layer frame, right? And that's the payload of the link layer frame, and it has some header before it that specifies all of its options. Okay, but the question is, okay, I want to send a packet to somebody. And we're on the same subnetwork, right? So what does it mean being on the same subnetwork? What is it? You don't have to pass a gateway. Yeah, if we're on the same subnetwork, it means there's no hops in between us, right? We're all on the same little network. So anytime I send a packet out, you should get that if we're all on the same subnet. Uh, for instance, if we had the subnet 11, 10, 20, right? So what does it mean when I define a subnet like this? Is this an IP address? Why not? Now, nah, missing the last octet, right? So what does it mean? Any of the last 32 is a host on your network. Right, so it's basically defining a prefix, right? So it's saying that 11, 20, 10 is a prefix, so anything 0 through 255, right, of the last octet, that's in the same subnet. Um, so the idea is we have a computer here, let's say 11, 10, 20, 1, 21, with a physical address, right, of something, wants to send a packet to uh, 10, uh, 111, 10, 20, 14, which has some physical address. Uh, and idea, so we want to send this IP packet, right, from one machine to the other. Um, <coughs> But really, we have to encapsulate that right in a link layer packet. We can't just send this IP packet out on the wire and expect anything to happen. Um, so really, we have to encapsulate that in another packet that is from our physical address to their physical address. right? And then we have to send that out. And then we can actually go through it. So how does that work? So Ethernet is actually a little bit simpler than uh, IP. Uh, you know, This is a link level thing just between you and the next machine, so it doesn't have to be so complicated that you know it has to work across the entire internet. Right? Uh, so we first have the uh, so, so these are in bytes. So we have the destination host in six bytes. Uh, we have our source Ethernet address in six bytes. Uh, we have a type, some data, variable length of data up to um, 1500 bytes, and a CRC, so a checksum at the end, right, to make sure there wasn't any transmission errors at that level. And so there's various types. So this is one another thing, right, where we, the types kind of matter. Um, so if the type is uh, in hex 0800, this means that we have an IP datagram. If it's uh, 806, it means it's an ARP request, which we'll look at in a second. If it's 808, it means that it's a reverse ARP request, and so on and so forth. There's a whole list that you can go through and understand exactly what each of these types are and what they mean. So just from looking at this, what does this mean about the length of packets that Ethernet can carry. You can just add it up. Hmm? You can just add it up. So. You don't have to add, right? So we only care about the data. We care about using it as a transmission protocol, right? So as long as it's able to carry our IP packets from one source uh, Ethernet address to a destination Ethernet address, I don't really care what it's doing. But the important thing, right, is this 1500. So the Ethernet length is only 1500 bytes, right? Oh, but our IP packet can be up to 65,000 bytes, right? Uh, 
right? So that's where we have that mismatch. Uh, so Ethernet, I, just so like a brief rundown, it's very widely used. Everybody has plugged in a computer into Ethernet. I hope it's really annoying when this computer does not have an Ethernet port and I have to carry around a stupid adapter in my bag so that that way I can plug it in. But anyways, um, it's very fast, very efficient um, for networking people. You know, it does uh, what they call carrier sense, multi-axis with collision detection, which means. When you're actually transmitting over the Ethernet link, you're listening to see if anybody else is transmitting, and then if you are, you both stop and try to restart and try again. Uh, so this way you don't have collisions like you know, with 802.11, right, and wireless, it's really easy because of the physical capabilities, right? We could both be on opposite sides of the router such that I don't see your signal and you don't see mine, so you'd never know that we're overlapping. Um, so destination address is 48 bits, as we saw. Uh, it's represented like this, so if you've never seen what the colon dotted um, uh, Ethernet addresses, MAC addresses, right, look, look like. Uh, source address, 48 bits, the type, uh, some data, and a check, a CRC check. Okay, now the question is, going back to our diagram, right? We want to send a packet, we're on a local network, so now we're not even talking about routing or trying to get our packet from one area of the internet to the other. It's just the local internet, right? We want to get a packet from one machine to the other. So what piece of information, what do we need to know to send an IP packet from one machine to another here? Let's say you're one to one. What do you need to know? Was it? Somebody want to? The physical address. The physical address of what? Your physical address? Before that. First, you need to know the IP address, right? Of the yeah. person you want to talk to. It has the same Thank network you. prefix. Yeah. And then we see it has the same network prefix. Then in the right. routing table, it will be. Uh, which we looked at, yeah. So we know this is our subnet, so we can know that this is clearly uh, in our subnet. But yeah, then we need to know the destination, right? We want to send this yellow packet here. Well, this yellow packet has our physical Ethernet address, which is easy to find out. And, but we want to send this to somebody else's. But all we know about them is their IP address. We have the request, so the router has a yeah, mapping with the physical and the IP address. Close. It's not the router, but yes. But the idea is we need, so these things, even though they're completely different protocols, right? So even though IP is completely separate from Ethernet, right? Here we get more coupling where, okay, we're kind of like a chicken and the egg problem. It's like, okay, I know what your IP address is, so I want to talk to you. But to talk to you, I need your physical MAC address, like your physical Ethernet address. But if I knew that, then I, so I could send a packet to talk to you on your physical MAC address to ask what it is, but if I knew that, then I could just send it to you in the first place, right? And then I wouldn't have to go through this thing. Uh, so they have a protocol, specifically ARP is what's called the Address Resolution Protocol, and this is actually incredibly security critical. So uh, this turns basically IP addresses into Ethernet addresses. Um, and so that's the basic idea. It gives us a way to uh, say, hey, what's the MAC address for, I forgot the network, 11, 10, 20, 121, good, you guys have good memories. Um, yeah, so we want to say, hey, who has this MAC address? And then that node will respond and say, hey, I'm this net, I'm this host, I have this IP address, here's my MAC address, and now we can start an IP conversation. Before that, we have no idea where to send that packet to. Uh, it broadcasts in the subnet, right? Uh, mm -hmm. broadcast. But, you know, what? But, yeah, it would be a broadcast, right? Uh, we'll get to it. Yeah, yeah. that's, I'm that's talking out of track, right? Well, I guess, the like address address that that yeah. ARP table, so you just... Ah, we'll, we'll get to it, don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. So, um, so, it's uh, actually sort of link level. So that's why when we saw the Ethernet frames, right, depending on the different type. So there's type of IP address, there's type of ARP, <coughs> which is type of reverse ARP, uh, or R ARP. Um, and so when the type is one of those ARP, re uh, ARP replies, sorry, when the type is ARP, then that means that we're making some kind of request. Um, so, uh, you know, but now we're also kind of a chicken and egg problem here, right? It's like, okay, we need to ask, essentially, everybody on the network, if they know on our subnet, right, who has this IP address, 
Okay, and so the way to do that is a special address to broadcast, which means, okay, here's a, here's an Ethernet packet, send it out to everybody as possible. Uh, we want to figure out, uh, I have a message to deliver to everybody. And so everybody gets this packet, and then the host that you're trying to talk to with that IP address responds and says, yes, uh, I, here's my, here's my uh, link level address. Um, and then, so if we did this every time we wanted to send a packet, that would be incredibly slow and inefficient, right? We, our network would be flooded. For every one packet you wanted to send, you'd have to send two packets, right? Say, who has this? And then they'd say, I have this, right? So you'd have to send two to every one, which would just be outrageous. Uh, so that's why we keep a cache. So um, host A will keep that answer in the cache, and so net going forward, anytime everyone talks to host B, it knows the Ethernet. And so it's kind of another optimization. So basically, when A sends its request, it returns, it includes its own IP address. How does this act as an optimization? Exactly. Yeah, that way, and not only host B, but any other host, right? It'd be like uh, me shouting, like, I don't know, I'm trying to talk to B. Uh, I'm A and I have this physical address. And now everybody who hears it can write that down and they can know exactly how to talk to me uh, and we can skip a step. Uh, is, does it send its own IP address or its own physical address? Both, because you need that mapping, right? That's what an ARP, ARP maps IP addresses to physical addresses, exactly. But I mean, yeah, from A, A is sending with the request its own yes. IP address and its own host? Yes. So, uh, so it says IP address because it includes its IP address in there. Um, the ARP request itself has the, depth, the source that it came from. So that's how it can extract that mapping. Okay, so then we can look at the format of an ARP message. Uh, so there's first the hardware type. There's different types of hardware. Uh, protocol type, the size. Uh, the protocol size, and it specifies the link addresses to be mapped. Uh, the op field says if it's a reply or a request. Yeah, in the back. Uh, I have a say situation where multiple systems are using the same IP address. Uh, so how would the op resolve in that situation? Yes, very terribly, if you've ever been in that situation. Yeah. So I, uh, at my lab in Santa Barbara, we frequently would have those problems where and the symptoms are very annoying because it's like intermittent SSH access. It'll sometimes go down and then you try pinging it and it'll come up. Essentially what happens, uh, it would be like, uh, I don't know if we have any overlaps of names, but it'd be like if I said, I don't know, who's Adam? And like two of you said, I'm Adam. And the first person that told me they were Adam is who I would talk to. Uh, it's the same thing that happens here. So I say, hey, who's host B? And I get two packets back that say, I'm host B and I'm host B. Well, the table only has one entry, so I just put the last entry I got in there. Uh, I put that in the table, and then that's who I talk to. Uh, and so it's very, very annoying. So what, yeah. what if an attacker actually sends you the packet last and makes sure that you map his physical address to the IP? We'll see what happens. Okay. Yeah. That's why we're talking about it. Okay. There's a hand over like a networking question, what, what does MAC addresses give that IP can't? I mean, why would we actually need MAC addresses? Because just asking IP should, should have also worked. It's a good question. I'll ask the room. Why do we need MAC addresses? Why do we not have IP addresses? Uh, on IP yeah. because or the other way around. Why do we need, why do we, yeah, well, no, why do we need, uh, yeah, why do we get rid of MACs and just use IPs? Yeah. Because MACs are uh, probably always attached to your system and IP are dynamically changing. Sure. Right, so the MAC right, is it's the physical hard address, hard right? Hard what's the address? Yeah, hard burn address on the yeah, lap, yeah, PC or the machine, but IP keeps on changing. Once you go out of the network and connect it again, we might be getting a different IP address. Do we need it? Do we need it now? Uh, we could still go to a different network, so they give us an IP address, and then we just use that IP address. Why do we need a MAC address? It needs a handshake connection again. Was 
uniquely identifies each machine and P1 for the MAC address. You can change your MAC address. <coughs> and even for the security yes, purpose. you can change your MAC address. You can change it to whatever you yeah. want. But it's illegal, I guess. Is it? Yeah. It's my machine. Why would I, why can't yeah, I change same it? Same as changing the <coughs> IMEI number of a phone. So on internet, there would be two MAC address of the same, ad yeah. Two ah, with the same MAC address. So that, gets, that gets an interesting point. So the MAC address, who needs to know about my MAC address? They're all terms with the they're all on the same network. On the same network, right? Just my subnet. So yeah. one reason would be, well, nobody else needs to know about my MAC address, right? So MAC, uh, MAC is only used to talk to the people in your subnet, nobody else, right? Everybody on that physical link with you. Once it goes outside of there, then IP takes over, and that's how your packet gets from one host to the other. But you can still use IP to talk on the same subnet, right? What was that? You can still use IP to Sure, yeah, you can still use IP. Yeah. So maybe it's an encapsulation thing. Um, we, we are not necessarily bound to use IP as the upper the protocol. So exactly. I think that's more the reason. I, I feel it goes more to that direction, where it's the physical protocol could completely change, right? The physical protocol can be uh, wired, it could be Ethernet, it could be wireless, it could be over a serial link, it could be over a uh, fiber optic cable, right? Uh, the point is that the IP address is a higher level of abstraction over that, uh, and the MAC address is something different. Plus, oh, yeah. oh and I was going to say the other thing, well, maybe one of you is going to say this, so I don't want to say it, but uh, the other thing that came to my mind was, well, you can have one MAC address, right, with multiple IP addresses. So then you can also go the other way. You can have one IP, or can you go the other way? No, you don't want to go that way. Yeah, but you can have one machine with multiple MAC addresses, each with different IP addresses, right? Plus, uh, plus the link layer uh, uh, protocol provides other services like CRC, which the IP address doesn't provide. Like those, those are essential for data communication without errors and stuff. Yeah, yeah it adds other stuff. Uh, yeah. Potentially created separately as well. I mean, so good question. I think so. Ethernet came a little bit later. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's like Token Ring and a bunch of other older networks. Can it be for technology. the security purpose? Wait, it's like what? No, yeah. I mean, that, because you've got the star networks and mm -hmm. all sorts of other different ways that they used to connect everything. So I'm right. Yeah, it used to be, what was it? Token Ring, where like you would get a packet and then pass it on to the person you're left. Yeah. yeah. And then, like, that's yeah. how your packet would get on the local yeah. network. Oh, the star out You can connect to the network, but the administrator don't have a knowledge which machine is using or which machine is accessing what things. I think it's what it's used for. I wouldn't say it was necessarily designed for that, but yeah, that's what they will frequently do if you're caught abusing something, right? The way to prove that is to say, look, we got these packets of you of this certain Ethernet running a torrent stream on ASU's network, and they go and be like, hmm, your computer has this exact same MAC address, right? Uh, no, you're very clever. You clone your friends. So don't do that. <laughs> That's not ethical, right? Um, cool. Alright. Okay, so then we want to send, okay, so we want, we send, we put our, you know, when we make a request, we put our IP address in there, right, to speed up and to do that optimization. Uh, you know, we don't know the target Ethernet address. Uh, we also don't know, or the target IP is the IP that we're trying to map, right? We want to know who has this physical address. So now what it looks like, so on your machines, you can do this on a Linux machine. Uh, so ARP is the command to look at and manipulate your routing table in, on, I would say most Unix machines, but definitely Linux machines. Uh, so ARP.a -A in this case um, lists your routing table. So it lists all the entries in your routing table. And in this case, there's nothing. So we start off, there's absolutely nothing. So we're on host A, right? Host A's IP address is 192.168.1.100. And it wants to talk to host B, which is 192.168.1.10. Uh, so it knows its MAC address, right? But it doesn't know host B's MAC address. So it's going to, so what's the ping command do? It's alive or not. 
Yeah, so it's actually an IP level thing. So it's sending an IP packet with an ICMP message type uh, to say, hey, are you up? And then if that host's up, it's supposed to reply back with what we sent to that host. Uh, so the ping command uses this ICMP message to test if a host is able to receive us. Uh, it's a networking tool. It's not 100% always reliable, just because the other machine doesn't have to actually reply to our pings. Um, it could, you know, so it's not actually a great indicator that the machine is down. Uh, like Google do. Huh? They just drop the ICMP packets. Uh, actually, I think Google. Yeah, if you're pinging Google, you won't get the reply back. Mm, I think it's the other way around. You usually can ping Google, you can't ping Microsoft. The problem is if you do it from ASU's network, ASU drops yes. all of it. I, I don't know if it's requests or replies. Yeah, I did it from my home and still even it was dropping the packets. Somebody try and test I use WWGoogle. Yeah, I use Google.com to ping all the time. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the problem. Is it depends on your network, right? It's not a, a definitive indicator that things are actually up. Um, it's just a evidence that it's up. Okay, so when we do this ping, right, the very first packet that's going to be sent is an ARP request. So this is the TCP dump uh, output of this. So the first thing that we need to do is we say, okay, we know the IP address of the machine we want to talk to. Uh, we know this machine's on our subnetwork, right? Because we're on the subnet of 192.168.1. Uh, we didn't say it anywhere, but we'll say it here. Uh, so now I need to do, send an ARP request, a broadcast ARP request. So this is how, when you see this all Fs here, what does that mean bitwise? All ones. All ones, yeah, all ones. And that means go to everybody. Uh, and the important thing here, right, is this is link layer, so it's Ethernet. So this means all the switches on the hubs in between also understand this, and when they get a packet, uh, an Ethernet packet destination of all ones, they send it out to every machine as possible. They try to broadcast it as widely as possible. Uh, so we can read this. We can, you know, we can decode this pretty well. We can say I'm eight zero forty eight seven four eight three, right? Um, I want to send a broadcast, an ARP packet of who is or a request, and I want to know who is one nine two one six eight dot one dot ten. I am 192.168.1.100. Right, so now we've, we've given them all the information they need to be able to reply back to us. Uh, so we send out this ARP request, right? and on our simple little three network diagram here, both host B and C get this request. So why is that? Broadcast. Broadcast, yeah, sending it everywhere, exactly. That's the whole nature. If host C didn't get it, then they're basically not on our subnet. So now, host B is going to reply, and it says, I'm one, uh, I'm 013, whatever, 1D98D8. Uh, this is a message for 8048748A3. How did it know who to reply to? Yeah, because we gave it in our Ethernet ARP request, right? Uh, I'm this, this is an ARP message, it's an ARP reply. I'm replying to 192.168.1.10. Or I'm saying that I am 192.168.1.10, and I'm at physical address 0131D98D8. Uh, we get that reply, and then we, um, yeah, and then we can start pinging. I guess I didn't set this up quite right. Uh, we can start pinging. So these are ping messages. Uh, so these are IP uh, pings from. The way to read this is 192.168.1.100 to 192.168.1.10. This is an IMC echo request. So this is requesting them to respond to us. And then this is their response back, where they respond, hey, this is 192.168.1.10, responding back to 1.100. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the reply. And if we look on host A and we run the ARP command, right, so look at its table, now we can see that actually host B, 192.168.1.10, is at this location, at this MAC address, right? So our host A has cached the location of A's MAC address. And also, host B has also cached and knows where host A is, right? Um, specifically, so only two, we have a request, a broadcast request, and one reply, right? It wasn't like the host B had to then send its own broadcast to figure out how to respond and then able to respond. Every get how this works? Sweet. So now let's attack it. So what are our goals? What do we want to try to break here? What kind of things can we break? Trust. Between traffic and speed. What's that? I mean, get into the routing tables of hosts. 
better goal though, better end goal. Better end goal. To be a trusted computer on the network. To be a trusted computer on the network? Good goal. Overwhelm the table. Maybe overwhelm, yeah, you could think about maybe a denial of service attack against the table. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, maybe I can try to impersonate to take advantage of the trust relationship between two hosts. Yeah. Ultimately attack everyone in that plan. What was it? Ultimately attack everyone in that plan. Ooh, attack everyone. everyone in the local area network. Uh, definitely one option. Yeah. So we may want to say how do we figure out who's on the network? Yeah. Man in the middle. Man in the middle, what does that mean? Uh, it means that you're having all traffic forwarded through you. Yeah, so that could be one thing, right? We want to maybe not disrupt anything, right? Or maybe not attack anything. But we want to essentially snoop on all the traffic that happens in between us. Um, you can bring the land down. By What's that? Yeah. Sending the dummy packets inside the land so we can bring or slow down the land. Yeah, you could think, uh, you know, if you somehow got into the New York Stock Exchange local area network, uh, you could like take down a host at a very particular time and like sell the stock and the stock drops or something like that, right? That could be a good attack, yeah. Impersonate to be the DNS of the network for phishing attack. Tricky. Yeah. Yeah, you could, and that's kind of goes back to the trust, right? So you impersonate a trusted host on the network, um, and then now you're that host and you have that trust. Uh, yeah, so we want to, we can impersonate a host, we can do denial of service attacks, right? Uh, we can access information. Uh, we can tamper with some of the delivery mechanis mechanisms, uh, which we'll see. Um, one thing is, right, so um, what about just listening? Right? What can you do is just listening, just sniffing, called sniffing, but you know, listening, is that useful? Is that a security? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, why? Confidentiality, integrity, integrity, availability, right? So yeah, so sniffing gets around confidentiality, right? Like, I don't know, maybe I have stock market things on the mind, but you know, if you're able to get on a network and be able to, you know, you don't do anything overtly malicious, but you're sniffing and able to find out, hey, that this their quarterly results are going to be so and so before everybody else, right? That's like actionable information. Or if you find out that. The network administrator is cheating on his wife with so and so. You can then go to him and blackmail. like blackmail him to get more access into the network, right? And like you know, leverage that information for however you will. Um, you could yeah, you could do all kinds of stuff. There's actually all these attacks now where um, they'll email. The goal is they'll try and email CFOs, like the chief financial officers in medium-sized companies, like 100 to 500, mm -hmm. and they'll say. I have this really important deal. Like, we have to sign this thing with this client. I need 50K transferred to this bank account. Like, make it happen. And oftentimes they do it. And once you do like a wire transfer, that money's gone. Um, so, if you could sniff, right, the network, see the emails that are being sent, you could actually impersonate the CEO really well, right? You could include his little or his or her little tag at the bottom, right, or whatever they do. You could see what other crazy, urgent demands they've done in the past and do it similarly like that. Like, do they type all uppercase? Do they swear? What do they do in their emails so that you can more effectively fish you money out of these people? Um, yeah, we, we could want to spoof. We could want to pretend to be somebody else. We may want to hijack somebody's connection and do kind of a man in the middle thing. So what's the big difference? So now we're on the local area network, right? So now we got to kind of move into the hardware. Like, what is actually on a local area network? Uh, so what's the difference between a hub and a switch? Are very 
intelligent. They're complicated, so you can configure them probably in that way. Uh, actually, usually, usually not, though. I think you usually have to have a dedicated router. Oh, we don't. We've, we've gone away from using packets mostly now. Yes. Yes. Of, but it's important to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Switch works on the network layer while the hub works on the data link layer. Yep. Mm. That's another good way to think about it, right? Yeah. So the hub is just basically a dumb repeater, mm. right? So I wish I had a switch around here. Um, right? Just ports. You plug it in. Anything that comes at one port comes out all the other ports. Right? right? So super dumb hub. Uh, one packet comes in, it just uh, sends everything out. But even the switch works in data link layer on the network layer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we'll look at that. The, so um, just to clarify, routers mm -hmm. work on layer three, switches work on layer two, hubs layer work two. on layer one. Yes, but why? What do they do? And how is it important to this? That's, oh, that's um, more the thing I care about. Well, hubs, it, they kind of share bandwidth. So you plug 100 meg Ethernet into a hub, and it has 10 ports. It'll share 10 megs out each port. And as you mentioned, like the data is sent out all the ports. Switches segment the network. So you plug in 100 meg Ethernet port, and it has 10 ports. Each of those get 100 meg Ethernet. Uh, that's if you have like an upstream hub, right? What if you're just talking about a local area network? Oh, plug in. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. The important thing from our perspective, right, is where do the packets go, right? And what so happens? So in a switch, we can control, we can create virtual LANs and stuff, but in hubs, we can't do all those stuff. Yeah, we can do all kinds of crazy mm. stuff in switches. Yeah, definitely. The, the main thing, right, for our purposes, we're a malicious person on the local area network, right? All traffic is broadcast to all ports, right? So any packet that comes in, regardless of if it's a broadcast packet, right? That's the key thing. Um, so that's another way of thinking of it. It's just the link layer. It's kind of like plugging all those computers just together. Um, modern switches. So switches bring it up a little bit, and they're a little bit more intelligent. The idea is they're keeping track of what MAC addresses are coming from which ports. And that way, when they get a MAC an uh, Ethernet packet in that says, hey, this is a packet to a certain MAC address. They know exactly which port to send it out on, right? And so they're continually updating their tables of this is the MAC address. It basically, so the switch keeps track of MAC addresses to ports, the physical ports. And But the important thing to remember, right, all broadcast traffic is sent to all connected hosts on a switch no matter what, because that's the point. Um, directing traffic is targeted specifically to an individual port that it's seen a packet coming from that network. Uh, so there can be multiple, so right, there can be multiple Ethernet, or uh, there can be not multi blah, 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 multiple MAC addresses associated with each port, right? You can have multiple, because you can connect these switches and hubs in basically all types of crazy configurations, right? Um, so just because one, one port does not mean one host. Um, okay, so we'll stop there. When we come back, we'll talk about network sniffing, which is very fun. Thank you.